All right, let's go ahead and uh, this morning's Sunday School is a continuation of last week, where last week we talked about uh, behavior and how behavior is learned. And I mentioned two women in the Bible, Aholaba and Ahola. And they were in the book of Ezekiel. And one is Israel, the other one is Judah. And their behavior was learned so that the proverb, as the mother, so is the daughter. And what we learned a lot from that is the relationship that a mother has with her daughter can, you know, obviously it can sway the daughter to think a lot like the mother. And in the Bible, we find people passing things off to their posterity, to their kids, whether behavior is learned or behavior is developed. You won't always find that, and this is just a, a marvel of mine, that in the scripture you have a king who is godly, and then their offspring is not, and then their offspring is godly again. And how people coming out of the same person, a mother, a womb, she has, say, three or four kids, and how each of those kids can be so much different than their parents, even in the way they think, act, whatever. Uh, I know of a family where one, there are two kids, one is a very conservative supporter of conservative, and the other one is a very much a liberal and supports the liberal platform and their sisters. And it's crazy how the one supports this and the other one supports that coming from the same, same womb. Uh, it, it is amazing. But behaviors themselves are learned behaviors. Okay, now, there was one that I, I didn't talk about when it comes to bad behavior, that, of course, a mother put a daughter up in a situation, and I didn't talk about that. Anybody know that situation? It's Herodias. Herodias. She had a thing against the man of God because he preached against her and the wicked lifestyle that she was having with Herod at the time. And John the Baptist pointed it out and said, it's not lawful. He told the man, Herod, he said, it's not lawful for you to have her uh, because there was an unlawful marriage there. And John the Baptist, as a preacher, as a man of God, pointed it out. And that's what men of God are supposed to do. They're supposed to point men's sin out, people's sin out, and preach against it. John the Baptist did that. Well, she decided to come up with a plan. Talk about conspiracy plans and conspiracy theories and Yesterday, with the uh, shooting of President Trump and the apparent uh, attempted assassination of him, uh, a lot of conspiracy things are coming up, whether they be true or whether they don't, whether they're not true. But in the Bible, we got this one here. We got a woman who gets upset with the preacher, and she goes back and she sets her daughter up in a situation where, hey, you go and you dance before uh, Herod. And get him to grant you a wish. And the whole plot was set up, was it not? The whole thing was set up some st from start to finish. Let's go to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. We'll just look at one more example of bad behavior in the Bible. One more example. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I have to admit, I used to not think much of conspiracy theories. I just used to brush them off all the time. I know a lot of people over the years, people in my church at Butler, a lot of them were into conspiracy things, and they would bring them up, and I would ask them, please just be careful in the church. You know, we don't want to... The, the thing is, the reason I would brush them off is because I know as a, as a preacher, my duty is to always stay constant to the Word of God. Always. And the devil's going to try any way he can to get you off the beaten path. So it's okay to read up on these things. It's okay to check them out and have an opinion on them. But just be careful that you don't get way over here into them because the devil, that's exactly what he wants to do to you. And even if you figure it out and you say, well, that was true, how much time have you lost for God? You know, it's, that's what I used to tell everybody up there. Let's be careful. It's okay to talk about these things, but let's stay on the beaten path for the Lord. 
But the older I get, the more I'm starting to understand that a lot of what you hear, there is some grain of truth to them. And you have to start thinking that some of these things, as we witnessed yesterday, it sure seemed like something was really weird with the way that all went down. And of course, there's going to be a lot of conspiracy about it. But when you think about the just the common sense approach of everything, to have somebody that close to the to the former president and not be caught or or asked, what are you doing up there or removed before he could have a chance to take a shot really is just a very, very odd scenario. I have to I have to say it's just crazy. But anyway, bad behavior. And Jimmy, if you could do me a favor, it's bothering me off that light is a spider web right there. Do you see it? It's just driving me nuts. Come over just a little bit. I'm sorry to stop. Tom, you're close. Yeah, thank you. It's hanging down and it's just like, it's hypnotizing me as it's swaying in the breeze. I'm more worried about the spider web than I am the conspiracy theories. Okay, Mark chapter six, Mark chapter six, and let's look in verse number 14. And we'll just look at this real quickly. It says, Mark chapter six and verse 14, and King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. So he heard of Jesus. Now you could see the paranoia here with Herod. He's worried, and he says, oh, basically I could hear him saying this. <gasps> He'd go like this and go, oh, it's John the Baptist. It, he's risen from the dead. Now here you can see in this that John's preaching is haunting him. But it's not John's preaching that's haunting him. What is haunting Herod? His sin is haunting him. And a lot of times in our life, our sin can do this to us. This is where sometimes when we exhibit bad behavior and we give in to bad behavior and we do bad things and we give in to a temptation, the haunting of the temptation, the haunting of the sin is so grievous that it can actually drive a person crazy. And this is where, and all of us should say amen to this, this is where the power of God's forgiveness is amazing. That God says to us, hey, don't beat yourself up about that. If you've confessed it, I have forgiven you. And how many of us can say amen to that? That we can lay down at night and we are not beaten up by our sins because we've been forgiven by God Almighty. But here, he was getting beat up by it. And he, <laughs> it's John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. It says, was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Okay? <clears throat> others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Now, that's crazy that that king would think John's risen from the dead. That's how much respect he had for John. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold on John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him but she could not. She didn't have the power to kill him. So what did she do? She created a plan. She created a plan. Now, there are a lot of plans and have been a lot of plans that have, even within our own nation, that people have plotted. Wasn't the King James Bible, wasn't there a plot against the King James Bible? They still celebrate it in England to this day, every year, the plot to assassinate the King James Bibles, the, the men who got together to translate and put the King James Bible together, they were meeting together. It's called the gunpowder plot. And there were three, three men that actually were executed because of this. They put gunpowder underneath of where these people were while they were trying to put together the King James Bible, and they would have succeeded, and they would have blown them up. But it was revealed the plot was revealed, and it was the plans were foiled. And how many plots over the course of time has God jumped in and said, it's not happening? 
my word or even with political leaders or whatever, even in our lives, has not God stepped in and foiled any plot or any plan that wicked people might have had against you or somebody else or against the, even the word of God, the plots. But in this case, and again, if God allows it, then it will be allowed. In the case of John the Baptist, he was a great man. No greater man born among women. God permitted it to happen. And the plot went down. It says in verse 20, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and an holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So Herod really appreciated John. And he appreciated his preaching. He knew he was wrong in what he was doing. It says in verse 21, And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod. Now, she was just a young woman here, a very young, in fact, probably quite young, uh, a young girl. Her name, and it's not found in the scripture. Anybody know her name? According to history, Salome is her name. She dances here. So, of course, this is all set up, pleased Herod. And then that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he swear unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. Now, what do you think he was gonna or she was gonna he thought she was gonna ask? Maybe for some riches, maybe for some land. Hey, I've been thinking I, I'd like to have some land, or give me some riches, take care of me. Was he expecting what she was going to say? No, my goodness, what comes next? And he swear unto her in 24, and she went forth and said unto who? Her mother. Bad behavior. Who set this whole thing up anyway? Said, you go in. I'm sure she did. You go in there and dance. And I know him. Didn't she know him? That he was a womanizer? That he was... He was an adulterer, that he was easily provoked in that manner. You go in there and dance, and he'll ask you what you want. And when you when he does, you come back to me. And she went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Bad behavior caused the Baptist, John the Baptist, to lose his head. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. What do you think the king felt? Well, it says, and the king was exceeding sorry. Yet for his oath's sake and for their sake, which sat with him at meat, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. Such a sad story, isn't it? A very sad story. One of the saddest stories in the scripture. Why did all that occur? It occurred because a mother taught a daughter bad behavior. As the mother, so is the daughter. The true proverb in the scripture. Okay, <clears throat> any questions on bad behavior? Last week I talked all about it. I gave you this example here. Any questions? Okay. We're going to go ahead and move into some good behavior. Let's brighten up the air. Good behavior. Let's go to Titus. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Sometime talking about bad things and can, can bring you down. That's like preaching on discouragement. Sometimes that can bring you down. You know, even though you're trying to get everybody excited. But there are things in the scripture. You talk, maybe preach on the devil or teach on the devil. And it brings you down a little bit. But boy, when you get on the Holy Spirit or you get on the resurrection or you talk about the good things of the Bible, how all of a sudden it elevates you and you get excited. Titus chapter two. Titus chapter two. Now remember, behavior is taught. You can be taught in righteousness. It says in Titus chapter two, verse one, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Okay, so older men, that's what's expected of us. 
older women, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So watch the alcohol, especially as you get older, ladies. Obviously, God put that in there. You know, there are a lot of uh, closet drunks among women. A lot of women. Who knew that? Who knew that? See, women don't come out. They won't, they won't freak with the bar. They're not going to pull up at 10 o'clock at night and say, hey, Joe, pass me a drink, you know, and sit with the guys and get drunk. Women don't do that. A man will just pull up to the bar. He'll go in. He'll say, hey, what's on TV? Or let's talk about the day. Hey, Joe, or slide me down, whatever. And they get drunk with their friend. Women don't do that. Women will hide this. And a lot of them, they get, I know a lot of women, they go home and they love to have their glass of wine. I work, I'm in the work world. I work with a lot of professionals. You know that. I hear them talk all the time. I can't wait to get home. I had a rough day. I'm just going to get my glass of wine and I'm just going to relax. You know, how many glasses of wine are you going to have? Got to be careful. That stuff can age women. The Lord knows women. He said, false accusers not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Also, you can pass that behavior off to the younger women. How important is, is it for the aged women in the church to help teach the young women? That's, that's the, the principle of the scripture. When you think about a church, and you see a young woman carrying a baby or a young woman with all kinds of baggage and coming into church and they got the baby in one, in one hand and they got, and they're doing this to try to just, the aged woman says, I was there, right? I was there. Boy, I, I don't want to go back there. You know, <laughs> unless, unless you're Lorena who says I'd gladly go back there. Right. Lorena loved having kids. Didn't you? She did. She did. And when the fourth one came, I said, you done? Ah, I don't know. I don't know. And Tony's like, yeah, we're done. We're done. But there are some, there are some women who just love to have kids. And then there are others, they have one or two and they're just like, I'm glad that's done. And I'm over with that. But you know what you went through. So when you see a young lady going through it, you can extend a hand. Hey, can I help you? I understand. Or maybe you see them turn their head and maybe in church they're crying or something like that. And, and you look and you see, that's not a tear of joy. That's a tear of sorrow. Something's going on in her heart. Maybe she's having a little bit of postpartum depression. Maybe she's having a little bit of being overwhelmed. Maybe she's having a lack of sleep. And all you ladies can say amen to that. And you could get that young lady aside and say, honey, I know my child kept me up all night. My husband did nothing to help me. <laughs> come on, ladies. Come on, ladies. Give me an amen. My husband, that old slug, he did nothing to help me. You know? Yeah, of course, he had to get up in the morning and be fresh for work. When I held down a job, too, or maybe you didn't or whatever, you say, I, and then you can talk to the young lady. And she could go home and say, oh, so I'm not alone. I'm not alone in my, in my thoughts. I'm not alone. See this behavior? You could pass on some good behavior. Don't get upset about the situation. It will get better. You know, the Bible says this. She shall be what? Saved in childbearing. How important that is. It's not a spiritual salvation. It's a physical, soulish kind of thing where she, she'll get through it. God gives more grace when you have those kids. And you know it when you're stuck in a nursery and you got three, three of your own that are hounding you and your husband's out there praising an amen in God. And you're, you know, yeah, yeah. and you're like, I'm getting nothing out of church. I'm getting nothing. My husband, and he just, you know, here we go again, that husband thing. But you understand it. You understand it. My wife at one time said to me, he said to me, Kev, I know I'm supposed to go to church. And I enjoy going to church. She says, but I go to church, you dismiss, and I go to the nursery. And I sit in the nursery. I don't get to hear the sermon because we didn't have a sound system at the time. And she says, it's getting hard because I'm getting nothing out of church. I get it. 
I get it. I understand. I, I can't say I understand because I don't. I don't. Yeah, and it was it was tough. It was tough. So if that happens to you or if it has happened to you and you go, oh, boy, church is becoming a drag. It's not that it's a drag. It's everything you have to do has become a drag. Even now, you might be sitting here and you might have had a rough morning getting your children ready to come to church. And you just might be worn out and say, they exhausted me this morning. And I'm sitting here and I need toothpicks to keep my eyes open. She shall be saved in childbearing. Very important to get that God is with you when you feel overwhelmed. And he provides extra grace. Okay, let's look at verse 4. That they may teach. See? Teach. Pass it on. This behavior is passed on. Good behavior is passed on. A lot of the reason our, our world is the way it is today is because people are not in church. Because this can't be done if someone won't go to church. But when you go to church, you do more than just hear the preaching. You are able to pass on good behavior and assist somebody in need. This is why the church is a living organism. We're all together in this. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands. And there we go, right there. What did what are they teaching the young women? That old slug that you're talking about, that husband slug of yours that you want to beat up, that you just want to hurt. And I I'm getting a lot of amens out of the ladies. The older women can say, hey, have grace with him. Could they also say, divorce him? Could they? Would a young woman maybe listen? Hey, let me get you aside. My husband was that way. I kicked him out. Best thing I ever did. I kicked him out. And you should do the same. Could that happen? And then the woman goes home and the young lady says, oh, Martha over there or Mary or whatever her name was, she's got a good idea. Learn behavior. How many marriages have been saved by an older woman stepping in and saying, let me help you, honey. Let me talk to you. It will get better. Come on, ladies. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and here, to love their children. To love their children. Hey, mental state of a woman after she gives birth. This whole thing of postpartum depression and all that can happen, some of the, some women after they have kids can really exemplify some very, very mental instability. For instance, I know a lady had five kids. She was giving them a bath and contemplated drowning all five of them. She was thinking of drowning all five of her children. That's how mentally she was getting out there from the load that was on her. You say, oh, pastor, that's crazy. Anybody know of a similar instance? You don't have to tell me what it is, but anybody? And how many have heard stories of women actually doing this? And you say, that woman's nuts. No, something was off. And it was caused through the pregnancies. And it was caused from something hormonally that went off balance. This is against nature, isn't it? The mother's supposed to take care of her kids. Supposed to love her kids. But yet the Bible tells us this, to love their husband. Isn't that the desire of a woman? So these kind of things... The older woman steps in and says, this is against nature. You're supposed to love your husband. I'm going to try to help you. The older woman steps in and says, this is against nature. It's not natural not to love your kids. I'm going to help you love your kids. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to show you some things in my own life that work for me. How important is that? This is learned behavior. And it can be taught. 
And this is the beauty of church and the beauty of having a friendship network. You don't want to go, go this alone, do you? You want to have someone that you could call or you could talk to, someone you can trust, someone that's going to give you good counsel. Okay? To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. And boy, if we ever needed that, we need it in the world today. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men, and God covers them all here. Scriptures cover the older man, the older woman, the young woman, and now the young men. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. So with the young men, it's important for them to get what? Grounded in the Word of God. It's important for young men to get grounded in the Word of God. When they're grounded in the Word of God, God can use them. And God can work them in the way that he wants them to be used. And when a man's following the Lord, his family will step in order. And really, because the man's the head of the house, God says, it's your responsibility to know my word. It's your responsibility to lead your family in the way of righteousness. Teach your wife the principles and doctrine of the scriptures and pass that on to your children. And that's where the young men are failing because they don't have a knowledge of God. Sound speech, okay? Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he, that it's of the contrary part, may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. They should have character and a reputation that is impeccable, okay? Again, that is behavior that is taught. Now, Let's look at 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5. If you're a widow here today, if you're widowed, there's scripture even for widows. It says in verse number, let's look in... Uh, Verse number nine, let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. So a widow in the eyes of the Lord, a widow isn't considered to be a needy widow until she gets to be 60, three score years. Well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers. So if this person has done all this, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work, but the younger widows refuse. That would be anybody 60 and under. The Lord says, don't take them into the number because they're too young. Why? Why? Because they could still find a husband. But the younger w widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. So, okay, let's take a widow. A, wo a woman who's widowed has a tendency to get what? They can get bored. You get bored. Nobody around, not working, nothing to do. What happens? The Lord says, be careful, especially if you're in that state, because you can become idle. And then when an idle mind, as they say, is the devil's workshop, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. So they tend to, if they're not careful, the temptation for an older woman who's a widow is to get involved in things that they don't belong in and being busybodies, tattlers, okay? Talking a lot and bringing up stories, speak things they ought not, okay? It says in verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, and guide the house. So Paul's recommendation to Timothy when he wrote this, 
in the scripture was is that the younger women should marry. And we're seeing in our world today where the marriage age is beginning to what? It's going up. And a lot of women, because the marriage age is going up, a lot of women are succumbing to living together with someone. This is why, because men don't want to marry anymore. And it's become easy, easy on men. They just get a woman and say, I'm not going to marry you. And then the woman gets a little desperate. And next thing you know, she's moving in with him. This is what's happening. And the Bible tells us all about this. God's command to younger women is it's good to get married. The younger women should marry and should get started with the house and having children. This is God's recommendation. The world doesn't see things the way God sees it. The world just thinks it's all okay. God said there's a price to be paid for not obeying the Lord. Price to be paid. Okay, God tells us that. Again, behavior that's learned. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry. Bear children. And how many are hearing? And this is another thing. It drives me nuts. I have grand dogs. How many have heard somebody say that? They don't want grand dogs. They want grandkids. Well, you know, I got grand dogs. And I say, you happy with grand dogs? No. I don't think my kids are ever going to have kids. I haven't been hearing that so much anymore. People get married and they're just, we're not having kids. Just not. Is that a biblical principle? <laughs> what does God say? Younger women, what? Get married and have kids. Have them. That's what God says. Again, I'm not God. I didn't write this book. I don't know the mind of men and women the way God does. And neither do you. But when God says something, it's because God created man. And he knows man. And God made a woman from the man. You know, the woman is the only thing. I don't want to say only person, but I don't want to say thing. Thing. I could say thing that God created. Okay, the woman is the only thing that God created. Can anybody finish my statement? Using part of his other creation. The woman was not created from water, as the whales and some birds. The woman was not created from the dirt, as the rest of the creation. The woman is the only creation that came from something else that was living. Who knew that? That's strange, isn't it? You ladies are strange. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're strange that you, you came from us. To, that's why you're strange. You say, yeah, I blame it on the man because that's who I came from. But <laughs> God knows his creation. And God made man in a certain way. And he made that woman in a certain way. And God said, this is how I want you to live. These are going to be your temptations and your problems. And these are going to be your temptations and your problems. Now come together and try to get along. <laughs> and the, the weird thing about that is men are from Mars and women are from Venus. As the book says, it's almost like you came from two different planets. And the Lord says, okay, now I'm going to take two that are very different Put them together, and you two get along. Only by the grace of God. Don't you need some help along the way? Yes. Behavior is learned. It's learned in a good way, just as it was in a bad way. I got a lot more. Who wants to hear next week, too? Okay, I'll make this a three-part. I, 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 and I'm taking my time. And I've learned with my teachings anymore. I'm slowing them down a little bit because I'm getting a whole lot out of it. And I think it helps me to help you to slow down and talk about these things. Like I have never really taught about widows. But it's important because we have some widows in the church. It's important that they understand how even being a widow 
can have its have its tough times. You know, of course it will. You don't have a husband. Maybe you don't have children that are always there to assist you. Maybe you feel lonely. Uh, maybe family just isn't as supportive as they need to, or maybe you are in a good position where everybody supports you and you're good, but you experience things that others can't talk about. And when somebody says, I understand, they don't understand. That's one of the worst things to say to somebody. I understand you don't, unless you've experienced that. So this behavior, again, young men, young ladies, older, older ladies, older men, widows, it's all learned behavior. And you can pass that on and help and assist one another. So next week, we're going to get, in, going to get into good behavior, learning the ways of righteousness. And when you learn them, to make sure that you continue in those things that you've learned, to continue in those things. And that we're taught righteousness and the good ways by learning the book, by learning the book. I'll get into some of those. I should be able to wrap it up next week, but we'll have part three. Okay. All right. Let's, let's take a break.